All right, we're gonna finish up chapter three today. We are on page, hold on, let me get my page. Uh, we're gonna start with lipids on page 40. And um, we're gonna kind of wrap this up. We've talked already about proteins, protein folding. Um, we talked about carbohydrates and we talked about nucleic acids. We're gonna finish up with our last um, one. And I know the kind of the numbering, I just noticed that these Roman numerals were up here. Don't pay attention to that. Um, lipids are the, are the last thing that I decided I wanted to talk about. And so lipids are going to include three different um, types. Um, the first type are going to be fats, also known as triglycerides. And the function of triglycerides are going to be to store energy, like long-term energy storage is important to mention. Um, triglyceride, the structure is going to be a glycerol with three fatty acid tails. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, triglycerides are going to then be further categorized as saturated, unsaturated, or polyunsaturated. And I'm going to show you a little bit of information on just saturated versus unsaturated in a, in a minute. Then I'll talk about steroids. Steroids is a or type of lipid um, that includes cholesterol and certain hormones like cortisol and the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. And then the third type of lipid are phospholipids. And the phospholipids are going to make up the li lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So I'm going to talk about that. So these are three types that I will go into just a little bit of detail here in a minute. So if you want to pause the video and write down what you're missing on your notes, right now would be a good time. This is probably going to be a pretty short lecture. So um, you can take the time to really write that stuff down. So pause if you need to and then I'm gonna move on. All right, right here I'm showing you a fat, also known as a triglyceride. And so what you see right here is a glycerol, and you see a dehydration reaction occur between a fatty acid and a glycerol. And then you have three dehydration reactions that occur on that glycerol, and so it's going to have three fatty acid tails hanging off. This is an important molecule to uh, recognize, and what makes it easy to recognize is big and it's fat. And that's convenient because it is fat, literally. So a triglyceride is the fat that's found in food and it consists of a glycerol and three fatty acid tails. And the bond that occurs between the fatty acids and the glycerol are called ester linkages. And those are co covalent bonds that occur um, between the fatty acids and the glycerol. And so that's really all I, I, I want to show you about triglyceride, uh, the triglyceride structure. Um, I'd like for you to write down next to fatty acid tails are hydrocarbons. I know I keep bringing that word up because it's really important. This is an example of a really long hydrocarbon. And what do we know at this point about hydrocarbons? Well, I hope you know, is that they're hydrophobic. So that would be in something really important to write down too, is hydrocarbons are hydrophobic, fatty acids are hydrocarbons, therefore fat is hydrophobic. All right, we have three, or we have three, just two types. All I want you to know is saturated versus unsaturated. I'm not gonna get into polyunsaturated, just um, you can just cross that out there. So what I'd like for you to know is that a saturated fat is going to have straight fatty acid tails, okay, straight fatty acid tails. It is saturated with as many hydrogens as possible. There are no double bonds between any of the carbons. Saturated fats are found in animals, and so it is the lard of animals. It's solid at room temperature, and the example is butter and lard. Okay. On the flip side, and I, you're going to be able to pause in a minute to write this down. I just want you to look at it and then pause and write it down in a minute. Unsaturated fatty acids have double bonds between some of the carbons. If there are any double bonds between some of the carbons, you then re, the result is less hydrogens bonded to those carbons. That's why they're unsaturated. It's not saturated with as many carbons as it possibly can because of the double bond between those carbons. The double bond between those carbons is going to result in a kink or a bending of that fatty acid tail. So that's important 
to recognize. If a fatty acid tail is bent, there is a double bond between two carbons, at least one double bond between two carbons, that is considered an unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fats are found in plants. They are liquid at room temperature, and our example is corn oil and olive oil. So why is it that a saturated fat is solid at room temperature and an unsaturated fat is liquid? It has to everything to do with these double bonds prevent packing. They prevent packing, therefore it stays a liquid. So if you were writing while I was talking, you're definitely going to want to go back and listen to what I just said um, because that's very, very important. I will give you questions where I'm going to give you a molecule and say, is this saturated or is this unsaturated? Is this solid at room temperature or is this liquid at room temperature? So go back and listen to that if you didn't catch everything. And then pause if you need to write everything down because I'm going to move on to cholesterol. All right. I like cholesterol. I don't know why. It's just so unique and different. Um, anytime a student sees, I, when I show on a test, if I give you a molecule like this and I say, what is it? Students will a lot of times say it's a carbohydrate. It's not a carbohydrate. It's not a carbohydrate. And here's how you're going to know that it's not a carbohydrate. Do you see how these two rings right here are sharing this side? That means those two rings are fused together. So you're going to recognize it's a cholesterol, which is also known as a, you're going to recognize it's a steroid. Cholesterol is a type of steroid. You're going to recognize it's a steroid because there's four rings fused together and there are CH3, CH3, and then all of this is just carbons and hydrogens. It's one big old hydrocarbon once again. It's a hydrocarbon once again. These rings right here, when they don't show you any of the atoms that make up a ring, you can just assume it's all carbons and hydrogens. That's an organic chemistry thing. In order to save time, you don't write out the C's and H's. You just draw the lines and whoever's looking at it has to assume these are only carbons and hydrogens bonded together. All right, so that's how you're going to recognize a steroid. Here are all the different types of steroids. So steroid is the umbrella term for all four of these right here. So I would definitely, you don't have to draw them out, but I would definitely write them down. Estradiol is just estrogen, testosterone, cortisol is the hormone released when you're really stressed out, and then you have cholesterol. What I want you to know is cholesterol is the precursor to these three molecules. So eating cholesterol is going to help you make estrogen, testosterone, and cortisol. It's the precursor. And so you'll see there's a lot of, there's similarities. There are four fused rings and they're hydrocarbons, but some of the side chain groups hanging off are a little bit different. So I need you to know these four examples are steroids. Cholesterol is the precursor to these three right here. And they are four fused rings. They are hydrocarbons. They are hydrophobic. So if you didn't catch everything I just said, you might want to rewind and write some of that stuff down because that's going to be important to remember. And I'm not going to talk about that. Um, because you're going to do like a diet activity and you're going to do like a re reflection. I don't need to talk about it during the lecture. The last thing that I want to talk about are phospholipids. Phospholipids are the third type of lipid and they're very unique because they have a phosphate head and two fatty acid tails. And so what I need you to know about a phospholipid is, you're going to want to write this down. Actually, it's already on your paper, but you're going to want to like really pay attention. The phosphate head is hydrophilic. Why? Why is the phosphate head hydrophilic? It's because phosphates have charges. And remember, that negative charge on the phosphate is going to be attracted to the partial positive charge on the hydrogen of a water molecule, making it hydrophilic. So it has a hydrophilic head because of the charges on the phosphate. It's attracted to water. And it has two fatty acid tails. Remember, fatty acid tails are hydrocarbons. You're going to want to write that down. They are hydrocarbons, therefore they are hydrophobic because hydrocarbons are nonpolar. All right, so a lot of chemistry in this. 
Um, yeah, you're, you're definitely going to want to uh, rewind, go back through that if you really didn't understand what I said and write it down. Um, what makes phospholipids so cool is that hydrophilic head and those hydrophobic tails are going to come together. Don't pay attention to this me cell thing. Don't pay attention. This is like a proto cell. Um, when we eventually get into the lab, we're going to do a lab where we make little proto cells like this, but just ignore that for right now. What makes a phospholipid so cool is that they can be arranged in this bilayer where the phosphate heads are facing water and the uh, hydrophobic tails are facing inwards towards each other. So that phospholipid bilayer is what makes up the cell membrane and what makes the cell membrane so good at keeping some things out and letting other things in we will have a cell membrane um, lecture pretty soon coming up. That's part of our next unit, unit two. So I want to turn your attention to the um, page 42. Page 42 is just a really good way for you to organize your notes. And so I want to help you fill that out. So what I would like to do is just start from the beginning with proteins. That way I'm not flipping through this thing um, like really crazy. So let's just start at the beginning and let's try to um, fill out that um, chart on page 40. All right, so where it talks about proteins, um, if you look at the second column, it wants you to list the functions of proteins. And so here are the functions, enzymes, defense, storage, transport, hormones, receptors, and movement. So pause if you need to, but this is what you would fill out for functions of proteins. Oh, and structure, my bad, there's eight. Okay, and then I gave you all of those examples right there. So under examples, um, you can just do keratin and collagen as two types of structural proteins under examples. So that's the fourth column. Another really important example that I would write is hemoglobin um, from transport. Okay, and then we talked about um, the um, different levels of protein folding. All right, so now we're going to get into the elements. What elements make up proteins? You're going to write down C, H, O, N, S. That's how you're going to recognize them. And then in the last column where it says functional groups, you're going to write down amino group and carboxyl group. So pause if you need to. I think we got it. The elements are C-H-O-N-S. We got all the functions. Oh, the monomer is an amino acid. Monomer is an amino acid. So we should have protein completely filled out. Let's move on to, let me get through all this folding stuff. So I'm moving forward to nucleic acids. All right. Nucleic acids, the, fun the um, function is store hereditary information. So that would be under the function column, store hereditary information. Um, the atoms or the elements are going to be C, H, O, N, P. C, H, O, N, P. So you're going to want to write that down under the elements. There's no ratio. So C, H, O, N, P, we have the function. The monomer is a nucleotide. So nucleotide will be your monomer. Your examples of nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA are your examples. And then for functional groups, I would write uh, the functional group. If, if you look at a list of functional groups, really the only one from a traditional functional group list is a phosphate. So I'd write a phosphate down. All right, that's nucleotides. And do, 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 just scrolling through. I'm just kind of trying to... Um, help you organize this. All right, carbohydrates. We're on the carbohydrates row. The element ratio is carbon to hydrogen to oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. The function of carbohydrates, I would write down these right here. Energy storage, quick energy, and cell signaling, and cell recognition. Cell recognition is also important. Okay, the monomer is this word right here, monosaccharide is the monomer. Examples, I would write down glucose as your example for a monosaccharide. I would write down sucrose as your example of a disaccharide. 
I would write down starch, cellulose, glycogen, and chitin. And I would definitely know the differences between those. All right. And then functional groups, uh, the only functional groups that you're really going to see with carbohydrates are those hydroxyls, the OH groups, the hydroxyls. All right. Lastly, we have lipids. How are you going to recognize a lipid? What elements are you going to have? Um, so remember lipids kind of uh, just kind of lump all of these hydrophobic things into lipids. I would say the one thing you need to write down for elements is mostly carbons and hydrogens, mostly carbons and hydrogens. Oxygens and phosphorus or phosphates are gonna show up here and there, but I want you to write down mostly carbons and hydrogens. They're called hydrocarbons. And remember, and this is the last time I'm gonna talk about hydrocarbons, so just know it now. Hydrocarbons are hydrophobic because they are nonpolar. The function of lipids you have right here, uh, long-term energy storage, cholesterol and hormones, and then the lipid bilayer. The monomer of lipids, I would say there is no monomer, although triglycerides and phosphates both have those long fatty acid chains. However, steroids don't, so I don't think it's fair to say all lipids have uh, the same monomer, but you're gonna see a lot of hydrocarbons. I would just write hydrocarbons again. And examples would be um, butter, olive oil, cholesterol, and then you have those examples too if you want to write those. And then the last would be phospholipids is your last example. All right, so hopefully that kind of, oh, and then functional groups, functional groups for um, lipids. Um, it's not really fair to say they all are going to have a functional group, but with phospholipids, you see a phosphate if you want to write that down. But you need to make sure um, you write down that phospholipids have a phosphate, but like cholesterol doesn't, the other steroids don't or anything like that. Okay, this is a short lecture, and um, this is basically the end of this unit. So you are ready now for a review and a test over chapters one, two, and three. All right, um, make sure you come to Zoom with questions if you have questions over anything that we talked about in this chapter. I will talk to you guys later.